Reading informational passages that contain data require you to find central ideas from both a text and from data presented in a graph, map, table, or other form. Keep in mind, though, that the text and the data are related. In this case, all the information has to do with volcanoes. How I would do this? I would pre-read the questions first. This gives me a general idea of what to look for in the text and the data. Also, since this text notes which questions focus on the text and which are on the data, I'm going to consider highlighting key terms if I find them in the text or data. For example, question 7, the world's 1,500 active volcanoes have the common characteristic of... Notice, I'm skipping the multiple choice answers. For me, this is too much to keep in my head because the answer pool are variables. And so, if I'm considering all four answer possibilities, it's like keeping four ideas in my head instead of just one. To the text. I see the number 1500 right away, in the sentence. There are about 1500 active volcanoes, not counting hundreds more under the oceans, and any of them could erupt at any time, said Dr. Tom Casa Deval, Western Regional Director of United States Geological Survey in Menlo Park, California. That's already a lot of information, but I'm going to continue to read the section carefully to see if it continues to connect to the question. I see that 1500 appears again with the information 583 of the 1500 have exploded within the last 400 years. Now back to the question. The world's 1500 active volcanoes have the common characteristic of... I see that the question is asking what all 1500 volcanoes have in common. In other words, how are they the same? When I look back to the paragraph and the two different references of 1500, I start thinking like a test writer, in that if I were writing a test and I wanted to challenge the student, I might use these two references of 1500 to see how carefully they are reading. In other words, how can I trick the test taker? I see that the first reference is a long sentence, and so I could either highlight the relevant information, the information that fits, or cross out the irrelevant information, the information that doesn't fit. There are about 1,500 active volcanoes, and any of them could erupt at any time. The first part I crossed out has the phrase, not counting, so I know that that information does not apply to the 1,500, and so it's irrelevant. The second part I crossed out is information about Dr. Tom Casadeval. Since the question is not about a person, I know that this too is probably irrelevant. So now I'm left with, there are about 1,500 active volcanoes, and any of them could erupt at any time. Notice how the information is broken up a bit by the first bit of irrelevant information. The test writer did this on purpose. Remember, that is what a test writer's job is, is to trick you. Already, I think I have the answer figured out, but remember, there's another mention of 1500. I better look at that, too, in case the test writer is being really tricky. The second sentence reads, Of the 1500, 583 have exploded within the last 400 years, making them particularly dangerous. What this sentence is saying is that not all of the 1500 volcanoes have exploded, only 583. When I think of my question again, it wants me to note what they have in common. This statement is talking about a difference, so I know that this too is irrelevant. Now I'm pretty sure I have the answer of what the volcanoes have in common is, and that's that they can erupt at any time. At this point, I'm expecting to see erupt at any time as one of my answer choices in the multiple choice question. Now I look back to the answers in the multiple choice question and I see 1. Location, 2. Height, 3. Unpredictability, 4. Unattractiveness. I want to eliminate possible distractors. Those are the answer selections that the test writer puts in to trick me. I know location, height, and unattractiveness are no good because nothing I've read so far has talked about what volcanoes look like. So I'm left with unpredictability. Now, this word did not appear in the passage either, so I have to really think about what this word means. I know that something unpredictable means you don't know what it's going to do. When I compare this to what I decided is my relevant information, there are about 1,500 active volcanoes and any of them could erupt at any time. I see that they share a similar idea of not knowing when or if a volcano will erupt.
so I'm very confident that I have the correct answer. Notice how I really slow down and read and reread very carefully. I know that test writers trick readers in many ways, from simply reading carefully to understanding the words in both the text and in the multiple choice question and answer pool. Therefore, I have to make sure I understand everything as best as I can before answering. I also like to see if I can guess what the answer is going to be before looking at the multiple choice selections. Again, it's too much information to keep in my head at once anyway. But also, if I can come up with my own answer first, and I see it in the answer pool, or something very close to it, then my confidence that I'm correct is pretty good. In this case, my prediction that erupt at any time was not a choice. But as I read very carefully and tested all the answer possibilities, I found that unpredictability was a good choice because it fit well. I would continue to do this for all of the multiple choice questions. The data. Now I'm going to look at the question 14. According to the graphic, seismometers measure. As I break down the question, I see three things. The question is related to the graphic, the picture. It has to do with something called a seismometer. And that thing measures something. I know that measure is a verb, and so this thing, noun, does something, verb. The word seismometer stands out to me, and I see something on the picture labeled seismometer, but I don't really understand what it is I'm looking at. I notice, though, that there's a similar word, seismology, near it, so I wonder if there's a clue there. This tells me it's a kind of sensor. Now, what if I don't know what a sensor is? Well, I know it's a noun. It's a thing. As I read the definition, I see it's a thing that picks up faint vib vibrations. I still don't know exactly all of this, but when I start to compare what I know, it's sort of like this in my mind. As I compare these terms, I start to make a pretty strong inference here. An inference is an educated guess. I can say a seismometer is a kind of sensor that measures faint vibrations. I'm going to use this statement as my guess for the answer. When I review the choices of distance, heat, fumes, and motion, I can start to eliminate distractors. I know that a vibration is like when my phone vibrates, or sort of shakes. I know that shaking is not related to heat or fumes, so I'm going to take those out. Now I have to be really careful here. I see that distance and motion are both words that have to do with movement when I go back to my word connections from before. I can say that a seismometer is a kind of sensor that measures faint vibrations. I have to decide if vibrations are better described as a distance or a motion. So when I consider what my phone does when on vibrate, it might move a little on the table from the vibration, but the distance would only be a few centimeters at most. To me, distance is something more like feet or even miles and my phone doesn't move that much. On the other hand, when I think of the word motion, I think of shaking as a motion, and that's really what my phone is doing when it vibrates. So the best answer to the question is motion. Now, notice that it wasn't essential that I have a perfect definition of what a seismometer is. I was able to gather enough clues from the information in the graphic to make a reasonable inference.